a few weeks ago during my Sunday homily, um, I was talking about discipleship and what it is, and I mentioned in that homily that within di discipleship, there are two parties. There is a teacher and there is a learner. They are on equal levels, but you have to have both of those in order for there to be discipleship. Of course, Christ is the teacher always, and then the disciples are the learners usually. Today we have the story about the rich young man, and he gets off to a great start. He refers to Jesus, he says, good teacher, good teacher, he says it twice, which is right on, on spot, spot on, that's where he's supposed to be. But then, of course, when it comes to the answer about what it is that he has to do, he can't do it. You know, he has to give up all of his possessions, and he's not willing to do that. And in a funny sort of way, you wonder about his commitment when he came. He came really, I think, looking for a formula or a recipe, sort of. Uh, in our vernacular, he came looking for the app, and there was no app. There was a commitment that he had to make. But that commitment raises another question, and that is, what is the cost of discipleship? What does it cost us to be a disciple? And looking through some different quotes, I found some different points of view, and rather interesting. T.S. Eliot, who never wrote about discipleship, or was a great poet, though, in his poet, The Gidding, he says not, that it costs, the cost is nothing less than everything. Not about discipleship, but it says the cost is nothing less than everything. And that is what discipleship is, nothing less than everything. The cost of discipleship is a life, my life, your life, our lives. That's what we're turning over, and that's what the rich young man can't. He can't turn over his way of life, his life, to Christ. So that's the first thing. The people turning over their lives to Christ we say, well, that doesn't, maybe that doesn't really happen anymore, you know. But look at a person like Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, of course, is a Lutheran. He protested vehemently against Nazism in uh, Germany during World War II. Um, he kept saying, he said, you know, he said, there is a counterfeit currency in our country, meaning Germany. There is a counterfeit currency, and it's called cheap grace. And his point was, there's no easy way to discipleship. There's no, you know, you can't be in a way predestined to that. It's hard work. And he is living proof of that. He died in the concentration camps. He was hung two weeks before his camp was liberated, two weeks before Germany surrendered at the end of World War II. Bonhoeffer paid the ultimate price. Um, then you move on to somebody like Rodney Stark. Rodney Stark is a current um, social scientist. And Rodney's interesting. He talks about uh, cost-effective Christianity, that Christianity, in a way, has to be cost-effective. And in past years, it has been very cost-effective. I mean, you know, if you buy some toy at the five and dime or whatever and it breaks before you get it home, that's not very cost effective. Christianity has always had a very, very high price. But in turn, the payback, eternal life, has also been very high. Rodney Stark comments that, well, you know, this has been, a, this has been very cost effective. Although he does go on to say that that cost effectiveness is, seems to be running out, depleting, in the fact that people don't realize this. It's, it's reaching the point where people kind of feel like, well, Christianity is kind of on a take it or leave it basis. They don't feel this urgency or this need, and many people are, are in fact, leaving the church. Um, there's an interesting book that was recently written called Grand Theft Jesus, and the writer's comment about that is that he says, our problem is, is we've gotten away from Christianity and we've moved to churchianity. In other words, that we attend church, but we really don't subscribe to the values that are professed in church. And that's in his book. Um, finally, last but certainly not least, there is St. Augustine. And St. Augustine lived during a time when Christianity had gone from being a very, you know, a persecuted church to where it had become the official church of the Roman Empire. 
In fact, you had, in order to get a job, you had to be a Christian at that time. And so there was this huge upswing in people joining the church. There were people being baptized by the hundreds and thousands, probably without a lot of catechesis, if any. And, a, and there was this talk of Christendom, you know, the, the grandeur of the church and all of these things. And, and Augustine says, you know, that's not scriptural. That's not where we get to. That is, you know, that's not where we're supposed to be. And, and Augustine talks about the visible and the invisible church. He says the visible church, the outward signs, all the stuff that's going on is 95% of the church. He said, but the invisible portion is the small portion, the 5%. And he says, if you look at the Gospels, if you look at the way Christ talks about religion, about not religion, but about faith, it's in that smallness, that 5%. He talks about salt and light and yeast and seeds. And think about it. You know, if you were making bread, it doesn't take a lot of yeast. In fact, if you use too much yeast, 5%, it blows up, you know, more than 5%. It blows up the bread. If you're eating a meal, you just need a pinch of salt. You don't need a lot of salt. Too much salt is poisonous and it destroys the flavor. You just need a small amount, a 5%. Think of light. Have any of you ever lit a candle in a dark room, in a pitch black room, and noticed the, the amount of light that that one tiny candle, that little bit, that 5%, not a searchlight, but that small candle. How beautiful that is. And finally, seed. You know, seeds are small. Think of the mustard seed that Jesus talks about in Scripture. And yet it creates this large bush. You know, here we are, what, 1,700 years, 1,600 years after, after Augustine. And with everything that's going on to the church, it seems that maybe, maybe we're moving back to that 5% that Augustine was talking about, that little small amount, that new, that new yeast. The question is, my brothers and sisters, if that's true, are we going to be part of that 5%? I think we need to be. Be that 5%. Be the salt, the yeast, the light, the seed, because that is what's going to save the church.